The Environment and International Relations There are three principal theoretical issues that emerge from the study of international relations of the global environmental policy movement. First, the origins, strength, and direction of environmental policy. Two, the distribution effects of climate change, particularly between high carbon emitting developed and developing states, soil rich and soil poor states, and states with varying levels of vulnerability to the reduction in theoretically renewable resources. Three, levels and mechanisms of cooperation between states on environmental policy. There are two crucial variables having to do with the degree of the environmental problem. First, the degree which the environmental issue can be solved assuming successful international cooperation. And two, the degree to which environmental issues exacerbate resource scarcity issues. These three issues may be examined through the basic assumptions of the principal three approaches. Realism, however, can predict state behavior if the environmental concern is sufficient to reduce either the state's power or its security, which is measured as its likelihood of a loss of autonomy. As the quantity and quality of arable land, irrigation, and fertilizer is a vital resource, states will be expected to seek agreements when these resources are at risk and threats to them cannot be solved unilaterally. For example, Policies of resource protection, such as fisheries, by restricting the path of oil tankers or of joint agreements to manage pollution near common geographic areas, or of limiting the building of nuclear energy reactors to avoid the consequences of nuclear accidents. Global, global climate change may create relative winners, increasing arable land in Siberia, Canada, Alaska, Greenland, and Scandinavia, and it may favor some states, and the weakening of equatorial states may shift the distribution of power dramatically. For example, the rise of China's power and possible emergence as a hegemon <clears throat> and its expectation of an Asian century may be undermined by its dependence on glacially sourced water, degraded arable land, and high water levels on its coasts. This could involve a Chinese bid to take over the Russian Far East when Russian nuclear deterrence or Russian deterrent resolve becomes weak. Now here you can see one of the issues of security, which is uh, Egypt's uh, challenge to the Ethiopian construction of major hydroelectric facilities. 85% of the Nile water in Egypt comes from the Blue Nile, which is sourced by the high altitude plateaus of Ethiopia. You can see here uh, in greater detail the Nile as well as its uh, sources and the construction of the dam that uh, has led some to speculate that Egypt was considering using military force if there was no negotiated solution with Ethiopia. There's a similar river dispute that goes back to the 1970s having to do with the damming of the Tigris and Euphrates by Turkey and Syria and its impact on irrigation levels in Iraq. What is visible here is the dramatic loss of land in Bangladesh with uh, simply a one meter rise in water levels and the cities uh, that it would impact with varying populations. This map shows the consequences of an 80 meter ocean rise resulting from the melting of the two polar caps. You can see in particular the northern plain of China is largely underwater uh, as well as parts of Pakistan, uh, Bangladesh, uh, parts of South America. So this creates a strategic situation and it alters uh, it has the potential rather to alter the power of certain states. Um, uh, Pakistan, Bangladesh, and China would be severely affected by this. As well in, as, as in Europe, there is a significant effect on the coasts of France, England, Germany, countries that have a littoral with the North Sea. Number two, the importance of industrialization for state power, of capitalism for generating productivity and innovation, 
and fossil fuels for national security leads realism to predict that states are unlikely to make agreements that would reduce the use of these instruments and resources. However, realism would also predict that states would seek to increase their autonomy by reducing their dependence on foreign sources of oil, since the intentions of another state are never reliably predictable. Here you can see a map of where the U.S. has concentrated its fracking in order to achieve uh, fossil fuel autonomy. Number three, since international agreements and organizations are the product of the configuration of the power distribution among the member states and are therefore endogenous regimes, the provisions of these agreements will represent the interests of the major powers. Realism predicts that states will seek to maximize their autonomy, which may act against the ease of states binding themselves to international agreements where there is a risk of exploitation. There is also the implication that any international agreement may simply be the interest of the world's leading commercial and naval power, the hegemon. So international regimes are sets of principles, norms, rules, and decision-making procedures around which actor expectations converge on a policy issue. It is a subset of liberal institutionalism, but does not automatically imply an international organization. A regime is endogenous when its processes and outcomes reflect the distribution of power of its member states. And it is exogenous when the regime has an independent influence on policy, meaning that it has its own secretariat or bureaucracy and is able to alter the interests and methods of its members. Liberalism. One, liberalism would predict that a functional application of domestic legal and institutional practices to solve domestic environmental challenges would also be applied to manage international environmental challenges. Now, path dependency describes the tendency of established practices to reproduce themselves, which is very common for bureaucratized institutions. This can be dysfunctional if readaptation is required to a changing environment, but reproducing past practices reduces institution maintenance costs. The liberal focus on domestic regimes may provide a better explanation of environmental issues and state collapse and the resulting foreign policies. There are arguments that democratic regimes with short election cycles are unable to engage in the long-term planning necessary to address the anthropogenic environmental challenge. Liberalism number two. Environmental distributional issues are essentially a collective action problem that is well simulated by the tragedy of the commons game. Essentially, there exists a long-term solution for distributing a scarce resource, but in the absence of successful collective action, individual actors will exploit other actors through unsustainable exploitation of the resource, making the resource ultimately unavailable. This model applies to situations of, for example, overpopulation or resource depletion. The tragedy of the commons. The mechanism of the tragedy of the commons game is that there is a single commons, basically a single property where farmers graze their herds and it's not fenced off. So the herds can mix. The incentive structure is that each farmer gains by adding an additional cow for grazing, because while the herd owner gains the full benefit, the cost in terms of gradual erosion of the common field is divided equally between each of the herd owners. Since each herd owner has the same incentive, the commons eventually gets overrun with herds and the land is eroded beyond the point of sustainable use, and all herd owners lose out and their herds starve. So for example, let's say you've got four herds, each of 10 cows. So the sustainability of the commons, let's say, is set to those 40 cows. Now imagine one of those farmers who wants to increase the amount of return they're getting proportional to the other farmers is going to add an additional cow. So instead of having 40 cows on the field, we're going to have 41 cows with that one farmer having 11 cows. Now, 
the land can only sustain 40 cows. So by adding a single cow, the farmer is accelerating the time in which the land is going to use up its uh, essential fertility. Now the farmer doesn't add more than one cow because if the farmer were to be too obvious then the other farmers would retaliate and then this farmer would lose their advantage because the farmer would not then get 11 cows out of 40 cows worth of grass they would only get 11 cows worth of grass out of 44 because each of the farmers would have added one cow. Furthermore, adding an additional cow could lead to a race where farmers double the number of cows to 20 to ensure that they're not getting less than their fair share. So essentially, they're accelerating the erosion of the fertility of the land by, because they're trying to avoid being cheated by, by other farmers adding too many cows. So the question is, how do you solve the tragedy of the commons? The traditional answer has been to privatize it so that you'll want to maximize its overall productivity over time. But this would require fencing it off, which is a transaction cost. You have to pay for the fence. There's also the option of collective coercive enforcement, such as the publicly accepted laws against bank robbery. So all the farmers would have to agree that they're going to punish the farmer that cheats. The problem is, how would they arrange to do that? It costs to enforce and the incentive is for the farmers to free ride and not have to engage in the in the activity of enforcement. And in the case of population control, which was uh, an example shown on the previous slide, those who break the rules or defy the morality will produce the greatest proportion of offspring for the next generation, where those that follow the rules are going to get selected out because they're not going to have enough offspring to carry the message of restraint. For example, the United Nations framework on the Convention on Climate Change has found that while there is an agreement on the importance of global environmental issues, the agreements are made difficult by disagreements over the distribution of the costs. Who pays to maintain the equity of the system? So here you can see a single play game theoretic representation in its strategic form. You've got farmer A and farmer B and they can cooperate which is to maintain the stable number of cows that are uh, in conjunction with the sustainability of the use of the field and then you've got the choice to cheat by adding a single cow. And if one farmer adds a cow uh, it may not produce erosion but if um, both farmers add a cow, it leads to erosion. Uh, but the problem is uh, they want to maximize their gain and so they add a cow. And if they both add a cow, then it leads to a catastrophic failure for the whole system. Number three, liberalism explains the difficulty of maintaining environmental agreements on the technical complexity of the environmental issues. Knowledge about technical issues can be shared through epistemic communities. Epistemic communities are networks of non-governmental issue specialists with domestic and international reach who can influence policy. For example, the cost distribution formula for global environmental agreements largely depend on cost-benefit analyses developed by epistemic communities and shared between them. Constructivism, the environment. Number one, traditional national environmental policies have been associated with postmodern quality of life policies or health issues. These values become norms. Interest groups may influence policies with their activism. What are interest groups? Interest groups will often influence policy by affecting elections, but may also influence elected officials by pressuring them or facilitating certain policies by providing assistance in the writing of legislation. The dilemma is that interest groups often operate outside of the process of democracy, and they therefore raise the issue of whether they undermine the benefits of representative government, such as legitimacy and efficiency. Constructivism may provide a definition of a national interest by the infusion of ideas. Realism assumes that states are seeking to survive as their single goal. 
But state interests are empirically more fine-grained, so constructivism can better account for the origin of a state's interest. The emerging nationalism in developing states experiencing growth may undermine cooperation between states, because they will demand the benefits of industrialization. Constructivism may explain the ontological question of agency in the international system, specifically whether the state is the most efficient unit of analysis for predicting policy interests and actions. For example, a corporation unable to pollute within one jurisdiction may simply relocate to a more pollution-favorable state. There's also the issue of whether anthropogenic climate change is caused by factors that can be affected by state policy or whether the unit of analysis is the individual, the community, or a regional grouping of states. Two, the extent of interstate environmental cooperation depends to a large extent on the recognition of a common identity and a common fate, which influences the perspective on distributional issues. Global environmental policy, because of its anticipated disproportionate effect on developing equatorial states, and because industrialization is a key requirement for economic development and indicators of the quality of life, this implies a contested principle of justice. Number three, constructivism largely defers to liberal explanations of environmental policy implementation. 